You're worshiping in a church when the priest or pastor begins the communion ceremony, tearing bread and raising a cup in symbolic memory of Jesus' death. On your left is old Uncle Igor the trucker, whose rotting teeth are hoarding small remnants of chewing tobacco residue. To your right, Aunt Gertrude sneezes into her hands, which you happen to notice she didn't wash after going to the bathroom before the service. It's flu season, but she didn't get her shot. The priest lifts the bread into the air. And Jesus said, This is my body, broken for you. He tears the bread, and the congregants begin filing forward to receive the blessed sacraments from the same cup. If you can't help but feel a little queasy, you're not alone in wondering if this is sanitary. Are you gonna get sick? You probably don't even want to ask and risk offending your entire social circle by questioning such an ancient revered tradition. But is communion actually safe? Whether it's safe or not, even in times of global pandemics, priests and pastors continue this practice with the religious convinced that no one can get sick from communion. So it's important to find out whether this claim is based in reality or is simply a repeated trope by misinformed religious leaders incentivized to get butts in pews. Now, the answer to this question is actually a lot more complicated than you might think. And while, full disclosure, I'm not personally religious, in this video, I'm going to try my absolute best to provide a fair and nuanced position, avoid loaded language, and stick strictly with the facts so as to best equip you with accurate information. Now, before I dive in, I need to specify what kind of communion ceremony I'm talking about, because there are almost as many different ways to take communion as there are Christian denominations, and arguments over the right way to observe it have literally split denominations. Like in the 1890s after J.G. Thomas patented individual communion cups, the entire Church of Christ denomination split over whether to use multiple little cups or a single larger cup. Churches are divided on everything from how it's taken, to where it's taken, when it can be taken, how often it's taken, who can deliver it, who can receive it, what it is, what it does. Is it desecration if some crumbs or drops fall on the ground? Excuse me, sir, is everything okay? No, Jesus is on the floor. Some Christians, like Quakers, don't take it at all. And in the early days, some churches even used Holy Communion straws. My straw reaches across the room. I drink your body. Now, while some denominations shun the legalism of these differences and say that it really doesn't matter, to others, proper observance of the Eucharist is a matter of eternal salvation. Historically, when someone was kicked out of the church, the term excommunication literally meant to cut someone off from taking communion. Excommunicado. But personally, I don't really care about church dogma, so I'm only going to be covering the physical act of taking communion by drinking from a shared cup, as many Catholics and some Protestants do, and from a shared spoon, as the Eastern Orthodox Church does. Both practices have fallen under heavy scrutiny during the COVID-19 pandemic, as many of these churches have not only remained open, but have held services and shared communion. Just how much are they putting their congregants at risk? Well, they argue that they aren't. The main defenses for both the spoon and the shared cup are the same and consist of four main claims. Claim number one, wine is alcoholic and alcohol kills germs. Obviously, this one only applies to churches that use alcoholic wine and not juice. While it's true that ethyl alcohol, the kind found in both wine and disinfectant cleaners, can break down bacteria and viruses, the effectiveness of a disinfectant depends predominantly on two factors. One, how much alcohol is in the cleaner as a percentage of the whole? And two, how long has an object or surface been exposed to the disinfecting solution, allowing the alcohol time to chemically break down the pathogens? Globally, the average wine is only about 11.6% alcohol by volume, or ABV. And most Catholic or Orthodox churches use sweet wines, which are even less, between 5.5% and 10% ABV. And that's before they dilute them down with water. You also probably noticed that I poured water in there. During the early days of communion, it became a canon law that the wine be mixed with water. The CDC, on the other hand, recommends that disinfectant cleaners have at least 60% ethyl alcohol content to effectively sanitize surfaces, and even then, the surface needs to sit visibly wet for anywhere from 60 seconds to 10 minutes, depending on the cleaner. 
compare that to how long the communion spoon has contact with the wine between recipients. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Literally less than five seconds from wine to lips. Claim number two, the communion chalices and spoons are made of antimicrobial metals like silver or gold, which kill all germs on contact. It's absolutely true that certain metals like copper, gold, and silver have antimicrobial properties. But as with the alcohol claim, it takes time. How much time? Well, one Cambridge study found that H1N1, better known as swine flu, could survive for up to four hours on hospital-grade silver cloth material. And a study at Manchester Metropolitan University found similar results with silver and food pathogens. Now, wiping the side of the shared cup like Catholics often do was able to decrease but not eliminate the number of bacteria on the cup. That said, the practice of rotating the cup between recipients had no noticeable impact on limiting the spread of bacteria. Claim number three, communion itself has healing spiritual properties and God would never allow harm to come to Christians via Holy Communion, or as the Bishop of London put it, no genuinely believing Christian can for one moment accept that the holy mysteries might bring or be the source of sickness or ill health. The mysteries of Christ are the true medicine of our souls and bodies and bring nothing but life and life eternal. Whether this bishop accepts it or not, it's true. As I showed in my video on the Orthodox Church, religious groups that continue holding services and sharing communion during a pandemic are rapidly becoming contagion hotbeds. And there's a system-wide problem of priests covering up infection outbreaks in their church to protect the faith. This is not only dishonest, but it's criminal negligence. There's no evidence whatsoever that communion has any kind of unusual healing properties. This is an absolutely extraordinary claim, which if true, you should find statistically longer lives and fewer health problems in devout countries, but that is absolutely not the case. Some priests will even admit that the members of their monastery get sick a lot, but will fail to make the connection between that and poor communion sanitation measures, because doing so would be blasphemous. And while there is an old 1940s study that deemed that communion was in most cases fairly safe, multiple, more comprehensive studies since then have found that bacteria and viruses can and are spread via communion, including one study that literally swabbed the side of multiple shared communion cups 10 minutes after the service and found bacteria in and on all of them, specifically pathogenic, disease-causing bacteria and that was with silver cups with alcoholic wine in them. Now, according to the CDC, usually the practice of shared communion isn't that big of a deal. Not because there's divine protection over the communion cup, but because there's more to getting sick than just the mere presence of bacteria or viruses. Things like whether or not the specific bacteria you're exposed to are pathogenic, whether or not you've been exposed to them before and have developed an immunity. You also have to take into account the viral load, amount of exposure, the condition of a person's immune system and whether or not they're immunocompromised, etc. Of all the ways you can get sick, the mouth isn't necessarily the best vector for disease transmission, at least not compared to the mucous membranes of your nose and eyes. But depending on the disease, you very much can get sick by sharing cups and utensils with sick people, especially if your immune system is weakened or you're exposed to a new pathogen you're not immune to or vaccinated against, as is generally the case during pandemics. Different diseases are spread in different ways. So when Christians jumped on the fact that HIV, a bloodborne pathogen, isn't likely to spread through communion, scientists weren't exactly shocked. The final defense of the shared communion cups and spoon is the claim that there are no cases of clergy becoming infected as a result of consuming the holy gifts after the liturgy. I genuinely have no idea how anyone is able to make such an utterly unfalsifiable claim. Priests will brazenly tout this as fact with absolutely no way of either proving or disproving it. But here's why it's so outlandish. Most bacteria and viruses have multiple possible ways they can be transmitted. It could be through a sneeze or by shaking hands and then rubbing your nose. You could get sick from eating old meat or any number of possible ways. And you don't get sick the second you're exposed. There's usually an incubation period of several days or even a couple weeks between the time you're infected and when you start showing symptoms. 
So tracing infection back to a specific runny breadcrumb would be like trying to trace your cold back to a specific handshake or cough. Just because you don't know which handshake gave you your cold doesn't mean that you don't know that handshakes spread germs, just like communion does. And as mentioned before, rates of disease among religious people, including priests, are just as high or higher as non-religious people. Sure, they're not going to get sick every time. Even most times, they'll be fine. But that's just the immune system at work. Porn stars aren't exactly sickly either, and they tongue-punch each other's fart boxes on the weekly. That doesn't mean that buttholes offer sacred protection from disease, although it would be cool if they did. The fact is, there is no divine protection. Priests and Christians get sick at exactly the same rates as everyone else. But many religious believers think that there is, and because of that, we have cases like this. A church choir in Mount Vernon, Washington, decided to hold singing rehearsals during the pandemic. 45 out of 60 of them became infected with coronavirus and two died. A Sacramento megachurch is linked to over 70 COVID-19 cases. 2,500 cases in France were linked to one large church gathering slash prayer meeting. By early April, coronavirus had killed over 100 priests in Italy after they went door-to-door delivering communion to people. They think that their faith will protect them, but when they ignore safety measures during a pandemic, their churches become hotbeds of disease and they put their entire congregations needlessly at risk. In March of 2020, a South Korean church claiming to offer divine protection and healing was linked to over half of the cases in the entire country. And Kansas reported three church-related COVID-19 clusters as of early April. These are just a drop in the bucket of the countless thousands of church-related outbreaks. One bishop attempting to downplay safety concerns argued that taking communion is no different than letting a chef prepare your food, and pointed out how several restaurants were shut down in Chicago after health inspectors found rats in the kitchen. But that's exactly where the difference comes into play. There are no health inspectors for communion. A church is never going to get shut down for violating health codes. Now, don't take this as professional medical advice, but from every study I've read so far, if you're not immunocompromised on a typical Sunday in June, you're most likely fine. Taking communion is probably as likely to get you sick as making out with a stranger in a club the night before. But during flu season or during a pandemic, you should not be taking that risk with the lives of your congregants. I know that communion is extremely important to Christians, but it doesn't have to be done in such an unsanitary way. The data is in, and the claims of priests and pastors do not hold up to scrutiny. When making this video, I found very few video resources like this on the topic. It took weeks of thorough research to write, edit, and produce. So if you did find this video useful, this is normally the part of the video where I plug my Patreon and I go off some script telling you to like and share. But I'm going to be super real with you guys. I have been extremely close to burnout. And yesterday I had a video I was trying to get out by the end of the month. And I just, I, I could not stay awake. I have a tier on Patreon for hiring an assistant. And right now I can't afford it. But I would so, so, so love to be able to have a lot of the tasks that I do to have some help with them. And if you guys are able to just pledge a little bit to get me to that point, it would make all the difference in the world. You can also donate either on PayPal or Subscribestar. As always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.